Thank you. We've had our prayers for our concerns and our needs. We've asked the Lord to speak through my heart, and um, I trust he will do that this morning. But it's also important he speaks in your heart today. Bless us, Lord, we pray, and we thank you in advance for what you will do today. Amen. Amen. Uh, Leanne was talking about cold. I was thinking she you know, got down to zero. That's pretty cold. But I think of my wife who was in Montana and used to ride horseback, bareback horseback at 21 below zero. Mm -mm. And I say, why did you do that? <laughs> she said, we didn't know any better. Because <laughs> it's all relative, isn't it? <laughs> 40 gets that way too, 40. Yes, yes. And there's, when it's that cold, you have to have covering because if you breathe in, you can freeze your lungs actually when it's that cold. Planes stop flying because the tires burst and you know they break. Anyway, let's not talk about that cold. <laughs> Makes you cold just thinking about it. The title of my sermon today is "What Do You Think of the Christ?" Turn with me again back to uh, Matthew chapter 22, verse 41. We're going to read a little bit there. Today we're going to take kind of a deep dive into a, a, sub a subject. It's actually a um, into a, uh, a spiritual deep dive, into our own hearts. We're going to ask ourselves a serious question today. You see, it's on. Ah, good. I can't stay up here. i got to move around. Um, it's a serious question today. <clears throat> it's a, uh, and I want to I ask it to you. And I want you to really think about it. Ponder it. What do you think about the Christ? Now, we can give a superficial answer, and of course, it's going to be an intellectual response. It could be a somewhat emotional response, and I guess all those are part of it, but what's the experiential response that we have with Jesus Christ? What do you think of the Christ? Let's go to our um, text in Matthew 22. We're going to start with verse 41 for just a minute. It, there's an interesting little dialogue going here. There's been a lot of tension, of course, around Jesus and who he is. And, of course, the, 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 uh, the formal church has given him a hard time because he doesn't exactly fit their, their model, you know, of what, of what the Messiah was supposed to be. Do any of you have a problem with Jesus fitting the model of who you think Christ ought to be? Um, there is an issue in Christianity like that. You know, we see Christ as, as this, and, you know, God is God of love, so, you know, anything other than, you know, going through the good things... Uh, you know, we don't know how to fit Christ into that. Um, how have you molded him in your own experience? What, what do you expect? This doesn't always show up too much except when you're having a really hard time. <laughs> and then we sometimes get like, the, um, like we get like the insurance companies, you know, they blame all the bad stuff as an act of God, you know. And, and where are you, God, when it hurts? And, and it's just all kinds of experiences we have. And sometimes it's hard to know. The expectations that we have on Jesus that are basically created in our own minds, in our own hearts. And when he doesn't measure up, we have a hard time. In Matthew chapter 24, 22 here, beginning at verse 41, Jesus is surrounded by a lot of different people, responding to him in a lot of different ways. And it's especially interesting in the church, you know, which is the Jewish nation at that time, somehow they, they've missed, you know, what Jesus was all about. It says, and while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question, okay? Interesting question. What do you think about the Christ? Penetrate, what do you think about the Christ? Now, Jesus kind of knew what they thought about the Christ. Of course, uh, there's a lot of different ideas among Hebrews about that. But he said, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? <laughs> whose son is he? When you think about the Christ, whose son is he? Who said that? <laughs> All right. Only one in the whole crowd. The mouths of babes and sucklings. <laughs> 
Okay, who is the Christ? The Son of God, right? Absolutely. He's also the Son of David. The Bible talks about being the Son of David, right? Of course. Who is the Son of God? So Jesus asked them this question in relationship to how they perceived him. And they said unto him, He is the Son of David. Is that a right answer? Yes. Mm, mm. Mercy. No. Really? No. Is he not the son of David? Is he not in the lineage of David that God has been preserving Definitely. all the way through down through history in order to come to the Christ? Is not that a correct answer? Come on, Adventist. Yes. <laughs> Who said yes? <laughs> up there. Okay, up there. Uh, yes. That is a correct answer, right? <laughs> Okay, correct answer. And so Jesus goes on then. And he said to them, who's he? Jesus said to them, How then does David in the spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. You know what he's quoting from there? Psalm. Psalm what? 110. Good. Who said that? Who's got that? Ah, 110. You looked it up. It's in your Bible, isn't it? No. Yeah, that's Psalm 110. In fact, let's turn to Psalm 110 for just a minute. Very interesting psalm. They call it a messianic psalm, okay, because it actually talks about the coming, talks about the Messiah and what he's going to be about. And so here Jesus is setting them up. Whose son is, whose son is the Messiah, okay? Son of David. Who is he, okay? Uh, who is he exactly? Uh, how is he described, okay? What do you think the Christ is? How do you define that? So he goes to Psalm, chapter, the 110th Psalm, and he gives them these two things, okay? Verse 1 says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Who wrote this? David, it's a Davidic Psalm, correct? So David is saying these words. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. So Jesus pulls this one out, and he lays, it on the, um, he lays it on the Pharisees, and he asks them a question. How then does David call in the, in the Spirit? Okay, he's writing inspiration by the Spirit, right? How is he calling him Lord? And, verse, and then we'll go on a little bit more. If David then, verse 45 in Matthew if David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? Whoa. That's kind of a contradictory kind of thing, isn't it? How is he his son? Same way and no one was able to day. answer him a word. Oh, nor from that day did anyone dare question him anymore. Whoa, that was a powerful answer. So what's going on here in this verse? It's very interesting. Um, if you look at the, the Hebrew in this, or the, some back of the original languages, it's very interesting because there's two words there that are used for um, Lord, okay? The first one, the first one is the word Yahweh, Yahweh. That is the, the, the absolute epitome name for God in the Bible, okay? That's the covenant God, okay? That's the almighty God. Okay, that, that is, the, that is the, one of the, the, the highest levels of expressions for God, okay? That's that first Lord. That's that word, Yahweh, actually. Or some would give other interpretations, but that's it. Or other Greeks. What do you think the second one is? Because there's two Lords in that sentence, right? The Lord said to my Lord. Now, in English, it's a little hard to distinguish because, you know, you'd have to look at some other things, but... The Lord says to my Lord. What do you think the second Lord is? Anybody know? It's the, it's the term for Lord, but it's also the term Adonai, okay, which is another term for God, which has a different expression. Okay? Um, so that's kind of interesting. So what is David actually saying here? What is Jesus trying to say in this verse? Okay. Um, the first one, of course, is the word for Yahweh as the, the um, Almighty God. The other word, Lord, is used for like a Lord or a Master. Okay. Hmm. So in other words, it's saying 
Yahweh says to my Adonai. <laughs> now David's writing this, Yahweh, God, is saying to my, who's the my, who's that referred to? David, right? David's writing this. So God <laughs> says to my Lord, my master. Ooh, that's kind of tough. So God is saying to David's master, that's basically what it's saying. God is saying to David's master. So Jesus is saying, okay, answer this question. If the Messiah is the son of God, how can he be calling? <laughs> how can he be calling him his master? He's master, but he's a son at the same time. Yeah, and they're married. See, David is referring to Adonai as his master. You confused? Yeah, it sort of threw a little loop into the Pharisees as well. Okay, because <coughs> basically this psalm, this psalm is known to Israel as a messianic text, okay? And if you look at it, it has all kinds of references to the Messiah and what he was going to do and his power, his relationship to God, his relationship to his people, and his sovereignty and his dominance. And so David is calling him his master. And the Pharisees instantly understand what he is saying. If David is calling the Messiah, his master, and he has authority over David, right? And so the idea of the son of David, as they have characterized it, characterizes it here, takes on a whole different context. And the reason they don't pursue it is because they're stuck. Because they have to explain that the son of David means more than what they wanted it and constructed it to me. And so the question comes again. What do you think of the Christ? Okay. There are some answers in the scriptures which are kind of interesting. And uh, I'd like to take a few ones because there's a lot of different views. Let's go to, um, let's go to John chapter 18 for just a minute. John chapter 18. In our lesson today, we were talking a little bit about making final decisions about God's plan for salvation and redemption, and that there will come a time when it will be made clear in each heart what direction that needs to go. And there's challenges, you know, as to that. The issue is, though, how do we, what do you think about the Christ? In John chapter 18, beginning with verse 33, I have an interesting dialogue going there, going on there between uh, two very important people, okay? And this was between Jesus and Pilate as he's brought before him, before his crucifixion. It says, then Pilate entered the praetorium and again he called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Are you the king of the Jews? And I like Jesus' answer to, to this question. It's almost like the question he asked, you know, he, the way that he answered the Pharisees. He answered the Pharisees' question with another question, didn't he? <laughs> he says, is he the king of the Jews? And um, Jesus answered him, are you speaking for yourself about this, or did others tell you this concerning me? Wow. Now, oh, that's interesting. Is, is this coming from you? Or is this just what you heard? Why do you think he asked Pilate that? <laughs> yes, that's what he wanted to find out. 
Was it, do you think there was some sort of indication of a question, maybe? You know? What was going to happen to Pilate later? He would kill Remember, Pilate would interview him, and he would find no accusation. He'd find nothing to, to accuse him of, right? And so he took him before the people because he bowed to the pressure politically. He said, look, I find no, I find no fault in this man. I wash my hands you know, of this event. You take him and do what you want. And at the same time, we find out that his wife had a very interesting dream, didn't she? Mm -hmm. Remember the dream? Yeah. Yeah. He said his, his wife sent a message to him while all this is going on and says, I had a dream last night. I'm really, I'm really concerned about it. Sounds like Daniel or something like that, you know. He says, and I was told, don't have anything to do with this man, right? With this yeah. just man. So knowing all of that, Jesus is exploring. Are you asking me this on your own? Or are you just reflecting what someone else has told you? Now notice what Judas do, or Pilate does with this. It's pretty interesting. Um, let's go back to, let's see, verse uh, 30. Let's go back to, let's see, uh, 31, 32, 38. Let's go back to 34. Jesus answered him and said, answered him are you speaking for yourself about this or did others tell you concern this concerning me and then Pilate answered am I a Jew uh -huh. He's a bloke. Now that's an odd answer mm -hmm. why didn't Pilate just say no that's what you, they, they accused you of that and that's what you're here to you know here to I'm here to judge this but he says am I a Jew Look at, what does that say his heart was being pricked. Pardon me? His heart was being pricked. It sounds a little bit like it, doesn't it? Yeah. Hey, this is, this is a Jewish thing. I'm not a Jew, so, you know, this isn't a question that I can answer. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Then Pilate said, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. Now, that is an interesting statement. <laughs> he says, are you the king of the Jews? That sounds like Pilate's putting him in the category of a Jewish person, right? Or the Jewish nation. And he says... Um, his answer is really interesting. Uh, he says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight that I should not be delivered to the people you're saying I'm supposed to be the king of. That's interesting. If I'm the king, why do they want my head? Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? And Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. There is that truth. We we're talking about absolute truth this morning in our lessons. That good lesson. You missed it. You missed a good one. Absolute truth. Who is absolute truth? God is the source of absolute truth. And then Pilate's answer is very interesting. He says, well, what is truth? Well, too bad he didn't know it, but it was standing right in front of him. And then it's interesting because at that point, and when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. Here he is claiming to be a king of a kingdom, and yet he finds no fault in him. He wants to let him go free. Wow, interesting. So here Pilate, kind of on the edge, 
He's a man. Okay, he's a king. Yeah, maybe he's a rival. I know for sure that he's an innocent man. But Pilate would not answer the question, what do you think of the Christ? He deferred it instead. The angels on the day of Jesus' birth didn't defer the question. Remember in Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 11, they say a Savior is born, which is Christ the Lord. Very definitive, isn't it? John the Baptist believed who he was. In John chapter 1, verse 29, he says, Bless, behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. He seemed really clear right then, right? Now go with me to um, John chapter... Um, 1 verse 20, I'm sorry, Matthew 11. Go to Matthew 11, back a little bit from where we were. Matthew chapter 11. Now John is in prison. And uh, things aren't going exactly how he perceived them to be going. And in Matthew chapter 11, beginning with verse 1, it says this. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? Hmm. No what? Oh, no, it's not Matthew. Where is I? Matthew 11, right? Matthew 11, verse 3. I'm sorry. Wait a minute. Matthew 11. Oh, oh, now the uh, first verse just came to pass. It's verse 2. Uh, let's see. Hey, where am I here? Now it came to pass when Jesus finished commanding the 12 disciples, he departed. And John had read in prison where he sent to. There we go. Verse 2. I'm sorry. Verse 2. <laughs> verse 2, would, verse 1 would have been really helpful, though, wouldn't it? <laughs> anyway, verse 2. Matthew 11 and verse 2. Are you the one or do we look for another? The question again would come to him, what do you think about the Christ? What happened to John? He kind of had an idea in mind who he was and what he was supposed to do, right? And Jesus answered and said to them, who's them? You have to go back to verse 1. That's why it would have been helpful to do that. Now it came to pass that when Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples, that he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. Okay. And when John heard in prison about the works of Jesus, he sent two of his disciples and asked Jesus, and Jesus answered and said to them, that's John's disciples, now go and tell John the things you have heard and see, the things you hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the dead, the, de uh, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel preached to them, and blessed is he who is not offended because of me. John just got a little sidetracked, didn't he? With these reports reassured him. Nicodemus. The story of Nicodemus, you know. John chapter three. To Nicodemus, who is a teacher, a teacher sent from God. He was a man to be heard. But Jesus was not his Lord. Jesus was not the Messiah. He finally came around later, but he had a, a little different view. What do you think of the Christ? There were those who became submissive to his person and to his authority, and they called him Lord. Let's go to Matthew chapter 8, verse 5. Matthew 8, verse 5. 
Matthew 8, verse 5, it says, Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed and dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come to heal him. And the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. Wow. Am I get the right place? Yeah, okay. Keep me on track now. <laughs> centurion, I love this story. Here, a Gentile had a picture of who Jesus was. And it was an interesting picture because he pictured him as a person of power and authority, right? Yeah. He knew he, he believed he could heal. And he didn't even want to come to this. He says, just speak the word and it'll be done. I know how that works because I have people too. <laughs> And if I say, go do this, he does it. And if I say, go do that, he does it. And I say, go do that, and they do that too. And so just say the word, and I know it will be done. Whew. Boy, that's a picture of Messiah. Picture of who Jesus is. What do you think of the Christ? And then we have the demon-possessed man, of course, in Luke chapter 8, verse 26, 39. Um, the possessed knew, the ones who were in, the, those who were in the possessed mans, the demons, they knew who Jesus was, mm. didn't they? They knew exactly who he was. Why do you come to torment us? What are you doing? And Jesus says, go over here. Oof, and they go over there, right? They knew. The demoniac knew. And he went in to witness about what he had experienced and seen. That was pretty nice, pretty neat. Let me get the story of Bartimaeus. Go to Mark chapter 10 for just a minute. That's an interesting story. Mark chapter 10. And verse 46. I hope this one's right. I wonder where this is. More than I messed that one up. 46. Now they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. That's Mark 11, right? Verse 46. We all there? No, oh, 10. I said 10, right? I said 10, right? Yeah. And you're at that, right? 46? 10, 46. I keep hearing murmurs out there. I think, man, I've messed up again. <laughs> Just say amen. No, okay. Now they... <laughs> I would like to have the name Blind Wayne or <laughs> Blind Jenny or something like that. Blind Bartimaeus. And he was the son of Timaeus. And he sat by the road begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out to say, Jesus. Now, I want, to know, I want you to notice the term he uses. What does he say? Jesus, thou son of David. Say it again. Thou son of David. That's the same one that the, the Pharisees were, were getting with, right? Yeah. Jesus, thou son of David. But the Pharisees didn't see that the same way that blind Bartimaeus saw that, did he? They saw in this the Messiah. This is the promised one. Jesus, son of David, Messiah, deliverer. <laughs> Have mercy on me. Then many warned him to be quiet. But he cried all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Boy, what a testimony. Son of David. That's a statement of the Messiah. That's what he was referred to as Son of David, the Messiah. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Now, when Jesus stood still, what was Jesus saying? Now, he stood still. He hadn't said anything yet. But what did he say by stopping? If someone says, hey, wait, I'll probably stop and say, yeah, what? But if I'm walking and he says, hey, Bob, 
I'm going to keep walking because I'm not Bob, right? I'm Wayne. And he doesn't say, in some places, the Bible says that they call out, Jesus, right? They, call, they say, Jesus. But he's saying, Son of David, have mercy on me. And he kept yelling it. Son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stops. And when he stops, he's acknowledging you're exactly right in what you say. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer, rise. He is calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said to him, what do you want me to do for you? <laughs> I love how Jesus asks questions. It's kind of obvious, ain't it? You know, it's kind of obvious. I have a guy, you know, came up to me this morning before I came to church. He was homeless. It was kind of obvious. <laughs> I knew right away in my mind what he was going to But I did what Jesus did. You know, what do you need? <laughs> Start a conversation. What do you want me to do for you? He says what? Rabboni, teacher, rabbi, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight, and he followed Jesus on the road. Let me ask you the question again. What do you think of the Christ? Not theologically. Not just technically. Not just what you have embraced as a child as you've grown up in the church and have been surrounded by the spiritual influences of a long time. It's kind of sad sometimes. I was just talking to somebody this week about um, they asked me they've been to church a few times said, you know, why don't why don't you all invite people to Christ when you have your church services? That's a pretty good question. I didn't say we don't. I just explained kind of we do things just a little differently. But it's a probing question. And so we start into a dialogue. <laughs> Eric was there. <laughs> so we started kind of a, a question as to, okay, as people come up in the church, Unfortunately, unfortunately, our kids can go through all of our great schools. They go through high school and even into college and come out the other end and know about Christ but not know Christ. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes we can grow up, you know, in a spiritual environment and we can become cultural Adventists. That's sort of like cultural Jews. You know, there. I know. I know a lot of. I have, I have friends that are Jewish. I love Jewish people. Being around them, but I've, I've got a buddy. It's been my buddy all his life, <laughs> all my life. And uh, I was immersed in some of his culture growing up, and it was fun. They're they're really neat people. But they they live a, a Jewish cultural life, but they have almost no connection to God. Very religious, very devout, but God is just not that involved in their life. You know anybody like that? You know people like that? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the Pharisees mm -hmm. who spent their whole lives serving the Lord, teaching, probably preaching, and engaged in the in the services of the church and in the synagogues, guiding young people, teaching adults 
maintaining the heritage of Israel and um, teaching all the, the great stories of the Old Testament, proud of their heritage, proud of their nation, proud of their calling in God. And here the Messiah steps up and they don't even recognize who he is. That is scary. Hmm? No. They could have believed in the Messiah. He was right there. Right? Yeah. That's kind of scary stuff. For Thomas, it was interesting, too. You know the story of Thomas? Let's go to John 20 for just a minute because um, this is interesting. John chapter 20. Let's see if this is the right one. <laughs> Went over these, but you know, I've done it before. I've put a text down. I preached a sermon twice one time. And um, I briefed, I always study ahead, do all that kind of stuff. And I went over that verse every time I studied, every time I went through it, twice. I had the wrong text. When I was studying it, I went to the right text. But it was written wrong in my notes. How do you do that? Anyway, it's kind of interesting. Anyway, John chapter 20 <laughs> and verse 26. This is interesting. John 26. And after eight days, his disciples, Jesus' disciples, were again inside. Remember, this was after the resurrection. And Thomas with them. And Jesus came to the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach out your finger here and look at my hands. And reach out your hand here and put it into my side. Do you not, and do not be believing, unbelieving, but believing. Why did Jesus ask him to do that? Because when the reports came back from his brethren that Jesus was alive and resurrected, what did he say? I will not believe till I put my hands and see him for myself. I've got these pliers up here this morning. I came in the bag, kind of interesting. Kind of, like, kind of like Jesus had to grab him by the nose and say, okay, Peter, okay, Thomas, here it is. Sometimes you got to get hit in the head with a hammer to get the attention, you know? We all have different perspectives. But finally he said, my Lord and my God. The question I'm asking, I'm going to ask again as I show you this last story. I love this story. I'm going to share this. What do you think of the Christ? Who is he in your life? Doc made an interesting statement this morning in the lesson I thought was kind of interesting. You know, usually when people say, what are your priorities in your life? You say, well, it's God. <laughs> do you mind if I, mind if I borrow from you, Doc? <laughs> you should have you do it. You'd probably do it better. Anyway, it's God, you know, family, career, la, 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 la. <laughs> and he says, another author said, that's a bunch of bunk. Now, it may be the ideal, but in reality, we don't spend as much time with God as we do with our career. <laughs> we don't spend as much time with God as we do with our families. You know, we sort of slip them in there as much as we can. And so sometimes it's hard to take a real look at ourselves and look at our time and look, take a look at our priorities and figure out, yeah, just how much time do I give God who's supposed to be at the top of the priority list? You know what I'm saying? Anyway, this is a great story. So years ago, there was a very wealthy man who with his devoted young son shared a passion for art collecting. I hope I've read this here before. I don't think I have. Together they traveled around the world, adding only the finest treasures of art to their collection. Pricelic works by Picasso, Van Gogh, Monet, and many others adorned the walls of their family estate. The widowed elderly man looked on with satisfaction as his only child became an experienced art collector. The son's trained eye and sharp business mind caused his father to beam with pride as they dealt with art collectors all around the world. As winter approached, war engulfed their nation, 
and the young man left to serve his country. After only a few short weeks, the elderly man received a telegram that his beloved son was missing in action. The art collector anxiously waited for news, fearing he would never see his son again. But within days, his fears were confirmed. The young man had died while rushing a fellow soldier to a medic. Distraught and lowly, lonely, the old man faced the upcoming Christmas holidays with anguish and deep sadness. The joy of the season, a season that he and his son so looked forward to in the past, would visit his house no longer. On Christmas morning, a knock on the door awakened the desperate old man. As he walked to the door, the masterpieces of art on the walls only reminded him of his son, only reminded him that his son was not coming home. He opened the door and was greeted by a soldier with a large package in his hand. The soldier introduced himself to the old man saying, I am a friend of your son. I was the one he was rescuing when he died. May I come in for a few moments? I have something to show you. As the two began to talk, the soldier told of how the man's son had told everyone of his father's love, his love of fine art. I'm also an artist, said the soldier, and I want to give you this. As the old man began to unwrap the package, the paper gave, wheel, gave way to reveal a portrait of the man's son. Though the world would never consider it a work of genius, the painting featured the young man's face in striking detail. Overcome with emotion, the old man thanked the soldier, promising to hang the portrait above the fireplace. A few hours later, after the soldier had departed, the old man set about his task. True to his word, the painting went above the fireplace, pushing aside thousands of dollars worth of paintings. And then the old man sat in his chair and spent Christmas gazing at the gift that he had been given. During the days and weeks that followed, the man learned that his son had rescued dozens of wounded soldiers before a bullet stilled his caring heart. As the stories of his son's gallantry continued to reach him, fatherly pride and satisfaction began to ease his grief. And he realized that although his son was no longer with him, the boy's life would live on because of those he touched. The painting of his son became his most prized possession, far eclipsing any interest in the priceless pieces for which museums around the world clamored. He told his neighbors it was the greatest gift that he had ever received. The following spring, the old man became ill and passed away. And the art world was in anticipation since with the old man's passing and his only son dead, those paintings would be sold at auction. According to the will of the old man, all the artworks would be auctioned on Christmas Day, the day he had received his greatest gift. The day finally arrived and the art collectors from around the world gathered to bid on some of the world's most spectacular paintings. Dreams could be fulfilled this day. The greatness could be achieved, as some could say, I have the greatest collection. The auction began with a painting that was not, any was not on any of the museum lists. It was the painting of the old man's son. The auctioneer asked for an opening bid, but the room was silent. Who will open the bidding with $100, he asked. Moments passed as no one spoke. Finally, from far in the back came a voice. Who cares about that painting? It's just a picture of his son. Let's forget it and get on with the good ones. And more voices echoed the same thing in agreement. No, said the auctioneer. We have to sell this one first. 
Now, who will take the son? Finally, a friend of the old man spoke. Will you take $10 for the painting? That's all I have. Will anyone go higher, called the auctioneer. After more silence, he said, going once, going twice, gone. The gavel fell. Cheers filled the room, and someone shouted, now we can get on with the bid of the real treasures. The auctioneer looked at the audience and announced that the auction was now over. Stunned, disbelief quieted the room. Then someone spoke up and asked, What do you mean it's over? We didn't come here for a portrait of some old man's son. What about all these other paintings? We demand an explanation. The auctioneer replied, It's very simple. According to will of the father, Whoever takes the sun gets it all. <laughs> Just as the art collectors discovered on that day, the message is still the same. The love of the father, the father whose son gave his life for others. And because of that, father's love, whoever takes the sun, gets it all. So the question comes up again. What do you think of the Christ? Is he worth everything? Is he just someone in your life? Is he just something in your life? Or is he everything in your life? And that's the journey we embark on this morning. We have a lot of responses in the scriptures about how people see the Christ. But as you look into your own heart, have you given him yourself? Is he everything to you or just something? Does he have all of your heart or just some of it? Does he have all of your love or just what you have left over? Does he have all of your wealth or just what you can afford? It's not an easy question. The demands and the presses, but he who has the son has it all. I offer it all to you this morning. If you haven't chosen at all, I invite you to choose that today. Take Jesus and everything he is, everything he's done, everything he offers to you, his love, his redemption, his kingdom, his sacrifice, his future. He has it all. He says it is yours, but it comes with a price, and I'm the price. What do you think about the Christ? Is he someone, something, or is he everything? Our closing song today is hymn number 570. It's not I, but Christ. I'd like to share the words with you for just a minute. It's a powerful little song of devotion and commitment. It goes, not I, but Christ. Be honored, loved, exalted. Not I, but Christ. Be seen, be known, be heard. Not I, but Christ. In every look and action. Not I, but Christ in every thought and word. Not I, but Christ 
to gently soothe and sorrow, not I but Christ to wipe away falling tears, not I but Christ to lift the weary burden, not I but Christ to hush away all fears. Christ only Christ, no idle words are falling, not only not Christ only Christ, no need less bustling sounds. Christ only Christ, no self-important bearing. Christ only Christ, no trace of I be found. Not I, but Christ, my every need supplying. Not I, but Christ, my strength and health to be. Christ only, for body, soul, and spirit. Christ only. here and eternally. If you'd like that to be your experience with Jesus this morning, and you need his spirit to help you, God, will you stand with me and we'll sing this song together, the song of commitment. Not I, but Christ. May this be our prayer today. Not I, but Christ, be honored, loved, exalted. Not I, but Christ, be seen, be known, be heard. Not I, but Christ, in every look and action. Not I, but Christ, in Not I, but Christ, to gently soothe in sorrow. Not I, but Christ, to wipe the falling tear. Not I, but Christ, to lift the weary burden. Not I, but Christ, to hush away all fear. Christ only, Christ, no idle words are falling. Christ only, Christ, no needless bustling sound. Christ only, Christ, no self-important bearing. Christ only, Christ, no trace of I be found. Not I, but Christ, my every need supplying. Not I, but Christ, my strength and help to be. Christ only, Christ, for body, soul, and spirit. Christ only, Christ, wait now eternity. Our Father, you have heard our prayer this morning as we close the service. And Lord, the question is still there. What do you think of Christ? And Heavenly Father, we want to answer it. And we want to see you. For King, Sovereign Lord, we want to see you, Lord, as the ultimate truth, the Savior, friend, counselor, our loving God, Father, center indeed of our lives. So, Lord, there's some who need to make that journey and need some help. Please, I ask them to see one of our elders or myself or Pastor George and make that journey to the center of eternity, which is Jesus. Bless us as we leave this house. And may the words and the prayer of this song be fulfilled in, by, through power, the power of your Holy Spirit in us. 
as we go into the world as lights in the midst of darkness. For we ask it in Jesus' name.